I'm Jameson Price, and welcome to the Infinite Ammo Syndicate. Enter, if you dare, and let's embrace some chaos. Infinite Ammo. Uh, so, I guess I'll host. So, greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a special IAS voice actor interview. We are interviewing Jameson Price, so we like to have him introduce himself and talk to the rest of the world. Hi, I'm Jameson Price, and uh, I'm a voice actor, actor, voice actor. I've done a lot of stage and a little bit of film and TV as well, but mostly these days it is voice acting. Mm, many, many, many commercial, under commercials, many, many um, video games, uh, quite a bit of anime. I'm approaching 500 on my credits for IMDb, so that's kind of exciting. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to uh, introduce my panel really quickly before we dive right into the questions. So first we have Mr. Eli. Yo, 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 what's up? Andre, introduce yourself, good sir. My name is Andre B. Venn. It's a giant pleasure to be with uh, Coffee Dad. <laughs> Coffee Dad? <laughs> yeah, Sojiro from Arizona. Yeah. <laughs> Inferno Dragon, introduce yourself. Hey, hey, what up? Next up is Tolkien. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. And I'm geeking out over here for this. <laughs> oh, don't worry. The, uh, the fangirling will pass. Well, maybe it won't, but you know, I'm just trying to get some wishful thinking. Next up is Rat Rat. Hi and hello. And last but not least, Mr. Brendan. Uh, hi. I'm actually excited and nervous, <laughs> you know. Uh, thank you for being here, uh, Mr. Bryce. Uh, it was an honor. You're welcome. Uh, just say he's the best, Barry Burton. Oh, thank you. I only got to do yeah. one of those. I, I was looking to do more of them because Resident Evil is such a fun series. You are yeah. great as Barry in 5. Like, his lines are just perfect. <laughs> oh. So we're going to get right into the document with the first question. I'm going to read that. Um, I would like to start this interview with the introduction. Can you tell the audience about yourself and your roles within the voice acting industry? Okay, well, I'm, I'm an actor, um, concentrating mostly in voice acting uh, in the last ooh, 15, 20 years. Um, roles in voice acting, I tend to get... Um, because I have this voice, <laughs> the big uh, god voices, uh, monsters, um, lots of authority figures, dads, generals, and people of that sort. Um, and then what's kind of fun in the world of video games in particular, because they want you to do multiple voices, is that you have a main voice, and usually it's something in this range, but then I'll have to do some other voices, which are as far away from that as possible. And so then it's working hard to try to take away the deep, rich, resonant voice that I have and and go with something that's a lot less resonant <laughs> or age-worthy or whatever. Um, but uh, I'm known for yeah, the announcer in Mortal Kombat, uh, uh, Chad in Bleach, um, Lu Bu from Dynasty Warriors, um, Bane Bloodhoof in World of Warcraft, Garen from League of Legends, um, and many, many, many more. So anyone has any side questions before we move on to question number two? Um, I got, I actually got, got one. Um, yeah. how do you feel, how do you feel coming back as, um, father near and, um, near replicant since, well, um, <laughs> yeah, cause I wanted to ask that like really badly. It's like, <laughs> cause I love father near. He's such a great character. He was a lot of fun to do <clears throat> back in 2009. Um, yeah, it was an interesting character. Um, I have a daughter, so I was really able to use, um, well, I have two daughters, one's a stepdaughter, but I was able to use my younger daughter um, really as a, as a motivation within that um, and the kind of paternal feelings that one has and to put myself into that, that situation with my imagination uh, and worked really well, had a good time with that. Um, mm -hmm. the, the game was reasonably well received, but it wasn't anything like the 2020 2021 which was it um uh, replicants uh remaster yeah. or redo mm -hmm. and it totally cracked me up because all of a sudden it was getting major pr 
yeah, we have the whole cast back. And cast are posting about all the swag they got. And I'm like, I'm not back. What are y'all talking about? <laughs> yeah, because it's funny. It's funny, Jameson, because like... Um... I was so left out on that. Because <laughs> <laughs> what's, his, what's his name? Um, I know Ray Chase and Zach Yagler voice like... They voice like younger versions of your character. It, it's kind of well, weird. Well, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's the... And as I learned about it, I was like, oh... Okay, this makes total sense. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm just appreciative that they did use my previous performance and put it in there. Um, yeah, so I'm in the game, sort of. But when the original game was a brother-sister pair, and when they brought it over to the Western audience, the brother-sister relationship, um, I guess it was felt that it wouldn't go over as well. I don't know. Uh, they changed it to a father-daughter relationship, which is where Father Near or Papa Near came in. Um, so this was being more true to the original um, uh, storyline, which was a brother-sister. And it was a younger brother and an older brother in the storyline, which is why Ray was the older character, because they didn't want it to be like weird with the dad. Yeah. So, up in there. so then I was like, oh, that makes sense. But I had to do some research on my own to figure out <laughs> and read a bunch of things, critiques that uh, that explained that to me so that I felt better about, hey, the whole cast is back. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're in it somewhat, but I'm kind of, but uh, I think they did like a DLC where you're, you're yes. back somewhat and like, a, it's kind of like this weird dream where it's like, he has like a dream and then imagines like himself in the future. He's like exactly, much yeah. Older and gruff, which I did so like a, that. That was nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's a DLC of my previous lines, so that you can you can get in there and play with that. Um, so that's nice. <laughs> so I, yeah. I, I I appreciate that because uh, yeah, I liked Near a lot. I thought it was a really interesting game. Um, I didn't get very far when I tried to play it, but. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I don't blame that's you. just me and my my poor gaming skills uh i have to get my son play games if i want to see stuff that i'm in <laughs> it's very time consuming yeah it's a really long game it's great yeah. though i think it's phenomenal Definitely yeah playing mm-hmm. all right so we're I, gonna move. Uh, i'm sorry oh, i the, i actually yeah. have a question in relation sure. to a role that you were in that you reprised oh. um, your role as ovon in dot hack gu Oh, yes. That's my favorite. So uh, 10 years later, Bandai Namco released a volume four that continued the story where it left off. How do you how do companies tend to get in touch with people who haven't done a role in like 10 years? And how do you get refamiliarized with returning well, to that performance? They um, the studio, the studios all know us. So the the company goes to the studio and says, we want to do this. And then the studio is, is tasked with finding um, the actors who are either reprising their roles or who are creating new ones. So the studio, I can't remember who, who did that one, but um, they would have contacted me and said, you know, hey, do you want to come in and do this? Uh, and I would say, yes, of course. Uh, and then it's a matter of them either providing me reference for the original um performance or me looking and finding and that's dot hack is i mean there's plenty of youtube stuff that i could go and search and i could find ovon um and refresh my memory and then of course in the studio they would also give me um reference um uh, recorded reference and play it in my cans my headphones so that i could then repeat back with a microphone because you know 10 years later who knows it's a different microphone different mic pre and everything um, so then the engineer is tasked with making whatever adjustments are needed uh, to help me sound like I did 10 years ago or whatever on that. Because if, if I recall correctly, Ovon was um, kind of a higher pitched, very even sort of almost creepy character. Um, but it was it was definitely less... Um, less uh, gravel than most of my roles are these days uh as, as you age your voice gets kind of richer and thicker uh so it's a little harder sometimes to get to back to that smooth lighter character hopefully i did okay <laughs> i i would say so certainly good 
Yeah, I didn't know you were Ova until uh, Rad Rad brought it up. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's a different voice for me. Um, uh, similar to like, uh, oh, Fire Emblem, where uh, I, there's a bunch of different things yeah. in there that I have bigger. You know, like Nemesis is big and uh, uh, King, but, King Rudolph. I'm yes. surprised to find yeah. Rudolph. But yeah. there's there's also a character Varen of 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 Varus of uh, starts with a V. Gosh, I can't remember. Um, uh, Varian. Maybe it's Varium. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you. That was a much lighter. Um, it's like um, much much lighter, younger, um, almost androgynous sort of character. And was I was going with some sort of um, indistinguishable European accent, so it was like it it couldn't be French or German or Hungarian, but it was a little bit of all of that together. So there was something weird about the 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 accent with him, but there were people who were like, "That's not you." <laughs> I'm like, yeah. well, yes, it was. <laughs> um, we we I'm not as good as some other character of actors about getting different characters um i mean i know some some actors who can i mean you cannot tell it's the same actor uh and it's it's that's so impressive to me it's very difficult for me to get rid of my basic frequency um and i work hard to try to get there so that i can provide different characters different voices for different shows and for different games when you're doing the same thing uh in a, in a session doing different voices so it's it's fun when you get to try to uh, attack something like that and and challenge yourself to go outside your comfort zone. <laughs> All right, so I want to continue on for question number two. So uh, can someone read yeah. that off, please, for Jameson? I got you. All right. <clears throat> All right. What motivated you to pursue a career as a voice actor? Serendipity. Um, things just kind of aligned. In, a, in an interesting way. Um, I have had this voice <laughs> all my life. So I've been an actor since the fourth grade. Didn't really choose, decide, make the, the jump off the cliff as an actor until I was in college. But I was through all of that doing vocal work. Um, in high school, I was in vocal competition, not singing, but like poetry reading, prose reading. Um, I was, people would ask me to do stuff. Hey, would you record this? So there was, there was the acknowledgement that I had a, a, a special instrument. There was something unusual and, and pleasing for people to hit, listen to. So, I was, okay, you know, there's, there's, there's opportunity here somewhere. Um, but, and I watched cartoons and stuff, but I still didn't think of voice acting as a, as a career. Um. I was doing stage work, I was doing film and TV, uh, and I did a show in um, in Long Beach, where I live, uh, at the Long Beach Playhouse, and I was working with Dorothy Fawn. Uh, and Dorothy and her husband, Tom, uh, do a lot of anime, but Dorothy was the one who went, you know, Tom and I are doing this anime thing, and we think, you know, you could probably do this. You've got, you know, a, something interesting. Uh, and so she brought me in and int introduced me to uh, to a studio. And they went, eh, okay, we'll give you a shot. And <clears throat> had me do, you know, little bits and pieces here and there. And just kind of let me put my toe in the water, gave me some really good direction and and some good uh, education in, in anime and in voice acting so that within a year or so I was doing larger roles and it, it kind of exploded exponentially from that. So it really was um, serendipity. It was opportunity. It was working with Dorothy, having her think, hey, why don't you come try this? The studio taking the chance on me and me being willing to walk through that door. What was... Um, interesting for me was that if you do film and TV work, those are long, grueling days. It's it's hard work. <laughs> it's fun, but it is hard work. You're up early, you're there all day long. And I have children, so I was spending time away from my family. When I started getting into voice acting, I learned quite quickly 
that you can get a day's rate for a couple of hours of work. And rather than the studio saying, be here at 5 a.m., you're in hair and makeup, you're doing this, going to do that, you know, then you're going to have <laughs> lunch and then you're going to work in the afternoon. And you're like, why am I there at 5 a.m.? Uh, so you're there the whole day. And in voice acting, they say, when are you available? <laughs> <laughs> and then I could say, well, from 10 to 2, because I have to pick up my son or take my son to school and pick him up after, after school. And I could work just during those hours and make a day's wage, which was pretty phenomenal. And uh, it was very rewarding. And so I got to be a much more hands-on and present dad that way, which was really nice. And uh, so that's that's kind of what that's what motivated me mostly as a as a voice actor, and it's just I have a lot of fun with a microphone. Um, microphones like my voice, which is great. It's it's really wonderful to have that kind of relationship with a with a microphone. That uh, I get I get in the booth and it's um it's free time. I play uh, where I don't have that same um, sense of freedom in front of a camera. I feel more constrained because the camera's looking at you and it notices everything. I mean, a microphone notices everything too, but vocally, I feel it's, it's fun to play. And then in front of the camera, I get inhibited and go, oh God, if I do this, this it's gonna mean this, it's gonna mean that. And I get lost down a rabbit hole of, of monitoring myself. And that's very bad for an actor. You don't monitor yourself, you just go and play. I have a side question from this. Uh, has there been a role where it's like, you took the script read and you saw it and it was like very challenging to get into well we don't see the script that's one of the things in in voice acting as opposed to uh doing a, a, a film or a television show um you sometimes especially if you're coming back for a series you do know your character uh, but you don't see the script scripts are hidden um sometimes you go in and things are codenamed so you don't know what you're working on you don't know what the character is you arrive for your work and they may give you um show you some artwork which is wonderful i love seeing what it looks like because that can help me um it's, it's, looking at the at the artwork i can okay this is how i think it would sound and then or he or she or it would sound and then the director goes, well, how, if we try some of this, just, so they're putting it together, the whole thing in their minds. Um, so there's often, when you're, you, you come in, you don't see the script until you're doing it. Also, um, do they do that to prevent spoilers, or is it like they come in and they have you have a go at the character as sort of like a test before they have like uh, screenings of other people? It's a combination of things. Um, it's not a test of screenings for other people. That's what happens in the audition process because mm. you audition, we all audition for these roles. The client listens back to all of these auditions and goes, I like this voice. Um, and then the director is able to put them all together um, and try to make a cohesive whole out of, out of the cast. The reason, as far as I know, um, because a lot of, uh, especially anime was, coming over from Japan, it had already been produced. When they first, before, just before I got involved, they, as they were trying to go from subtitles to dubs, um, or provide dubs as well as subs, they, they did bring in everybody, and they would try to go off of a whole script. Well, obviously, that's going to take a lot more time, mm -hmm. and you're pulling in not just one actor, but you're pulling in multiple, 10 actors, yep. all these different actors coming in and they all have to stand around um, while somebody does their lines and, and maybe the, the scene and stuff like that. But so it became, you know, not cost effective for either the studio or the actor. So it came down to, all right, we're going to take all of these, this one character's lines and bring one person in and they do those. And then the next person comes in and then the next person comes in so that they only had to bring in one actor at a time. 
that meant it was a little more challenging because we have to either imagine the other person speaking to us or with us. The directors will oftentimes help us out by reading us in and out of a, of a line. Or if they have already recorded the character we're talking with, if you're not the first one going in, oftentimes they will play that for you and you can react off of that. And so it is off playing off of another character, another actor. And that's wonderful. Um, if you're doing original animation, it has not yet been animated, 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 um, and they do have the full script and they will bring in all the actors together and do a table read um, and sometimes do a, a, a group record. And that's a lot of fun because then we can really play off of each other and, and act together. Um, again, it is, you have to draw, you have to walk that fine line of what's the cost effective way because this all comes down to money. Mm -hmm. You know, right. time is money in the studio. And so they want to be as efficient as possible. Um, they don't want to go over budget. They want to be under budget. Um, so that's kind of where that comes out. The reason they don't give us a script, and some actually, some do now, uh, will we'll give us a script beforehand so we can kind of, you know, come in ready to go, which is great. Uh, but there may be um, NDA, non-disclosure agreement reasons that they wouldn't, secrecy reasons, um, you know, or it's just not the way they want to work. And mm -hmm. we work the way they want us to work. Uh, we can we can ask for things, and we do ask for scripts if if we you know feel that we need them. But as as a voice actor, you really develop a a, a, a quick kind of improvisational imagination muscle that you can go in and oh that's the character artwork, or I know the character from before, here's the voice, boom. Okay, what's the situation and they're in and they're talking to this person. Do I like this person? Do I not like this person? Um, am I higher status, lower status? You, find, you can find different acting questions that help dial you into what the character is gonna sound like and what their tone of voice is, what their, their underlying, uh, we call it subtext, but it's the meaning underneath the line. That then is shaped by the director. Because I, I don't have the whole picture in my head. I've gone approach the character, go, oh, I'm going to do this. And then the director's like, that's great, but <laughs> this is what was going on. Oh, okay. So then they will shape the performance. So the director is very, very important in, in, in voice acting to make the whole uh, project a, co a cohesive one and that, we're, we, that we do sound like we're talking to each other as much as possible. Uh, and then also trying to be, in the case of dubbing, as uh, honoring as much as possible the original performances. So we, we do listen to them in, in Japanese, Korean, Russian, whatever. We listen to the original performance so that we can take that and not imitate it, but honor it, as well as reinterpret it, reinterpret it if necessary for an American audience. Because sometimes there are idioms or other things that are culturally appropriate in a different culture or country that will be weird in America. <laughs> and we have to go, ah, oh, that's not going to fly. Let's make it this. All right. That was a good answer. Really like... Long winded, oh, yeah. long winded answer. Sorry. It, it's long winded, <laughs> but it, it, it oh, makes sense good. because, uh, there's a variety of ways where this process is coordinated. So I had to ask. Yeah. Actually, I got a question too. Um, sure. I know you say you don't read like scripts or whatnot, right? But um, has there ever been a time where you need to improvise the line because you thought it sounded weird or off the, the character? And, and well, you're okay? yeah. I mean, if you, um, if I know the character because I've been doing it for, you know, a couple of episodes or, you know, a couple of years, um, I'm going to have, and especially if another, if a different director comes in from before, they will often go, you know, the character, does this sound like it's the character's voice? Would they say that? Um, a lot of times writers will write contractions. And if I'm playing some nobleman or God or something, they're not going to use a contraction. So we're going to uncontract things. Um, there are times when you for timing purposes, have to contract or, or uncontract to expand the, the line. Um, there are certainly improvisation moments that if something bubbles up, it'll come out because mm -hmm. we're acting. We're not, um, hopefully, not monitoring ourselves. So there are times when I have changed the line unconsciously. 
Right. And sometimes that has worked. And other times they've gone, um, no, we really need you to say this word. You missed that or whatever. You changed this. Oh, okay. And if it's critical to the storyline, you know, they'll let me know and, they'll, and we'll redo it. But if I come up with something that is more natural um, and character appropriate, that's great for them. Um, there's also times when the either the translation or the adaptation has been not inaccurate, but I mean, it doesn't match the flaps of the mouth or um, they were going, they, they didn't write enough and we have to write more. Um, and then it's a game of, of the director rewriting and me rewriting and who comes up with a better line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, but sometimes the engineer comes up with the line. And you're like, "Hey, great!" <laughs> <laughs> so it's a it's a real um, team effort. Actually, Jameson, I gotta ask him. I yeah. think you, you've ad libbed right uh, before. Yeah. Okay. I was just curious. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, we've had to ad lib stuff, um, especially when we're doing um, what's called Walla. That's all ad lib. Walla is um, like background stuff. And you might not hear it um, so much. It's it's a, when there's a group moment, you know, a group of villagers responding to the monster coming in or soldiers coming in to take somebody away. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's not scripted because they're only scripting out, out the principal character's lines. Um, and then within that crowd of people talking, it's called Walla. And then a bunch of us lay down two or three voices that are responding to the soldiers or the monster or, or whatever the situation is, the restaurant. Um, and I've done that also for, uh, uh, for films and done loop groups for that. And that's, that's a lot of fun. And so then it's, you have to come up with stuff that is not, um, that doesn't stand out. It can't be specific. So it's, it's very interesting. It, it, it can be specific to, Oh, there's a monster, but you can't say maybe what the monster's name is, or you can't say um, anything that's identifiable. Yeah. So it's it's very g generic speech. Oh yeah, like someone and you yelling. Um, and you have sorry. to ad lib it. Yeah. Oh no, yeah. It's like someone saying, "Oh my god, it's a monster! Look out!" Or like when you do like military streams, like in the in the war uh -huh. game. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's the but words. But then the things where we actually have to say words and you have to come up with stuff, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's a lot of, you know, hey, you want to grab lunch tomorrow or stuff like that? Or, you know, I can't believe that happened and things like, you know, where it's just, <laughs> yeah. just generic, um, vague conversation. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rarely do we have to ad lib anything that's terribly important. That's scripted out. That's. Mm -hmm. Because they they have people that want to that, that translate everything, and then story editors who adapt it and make it work and make sure that fits the flaps and put it oh, together yeah. so it makes sense for us. Yeah, translation's a lot of work. It's pretty difficult. Oh yeah. Process. Well, and it's sometimes the translation is great, mm -hmm. and then sometimes the translation doesn't work for the uh, for the American audience, and then you have to rewrite it. Um, but keep the the spirit of the original and the meaning, but you know, change it just enough. Oh yeah, they, I know they had to do this a lot of anime because, like, um, it's like really like for some some jokes won't really fly with them, and so they have oh, to yeah. kind of like fix it a bit so it's a little more, uh, it's a little more easier to understand. Yeah, yeah. It's like America and Japan are like very different culturally. Yes, jokes and um. Um, uh, idioms, sayings. I remember one sort of, uh, but it was something about a cat. And it was a Japan, Japanese idiom, made no sense for an American audience. We're like, the cat does what? <laughs> but in Japan, they would like, oh, they would know exactly what they were talking about. Um, but it was, you know, a cat, it was doing something a cat couldn't do. Uh, I don't know, I can't remember what it was. I should have written it down. It was years that was like and years ago. five for me. No, it was it was pre before Persona Five. Oh, this was, was it? like oh, this was like fifteen. This was earlier on. It was like fifteen, twenty years ago. Oh, damn. Um, when, oh yeah. And I, I can't remember what it was, but there was something about a cat, and we all looked at the line and went, "What on earth does that mean?" <laughs> oh, and yeah. we 
we luckily um there were um because a lot of studios a lot of anime studios have you know japanese people working so we were able to call somebody and go what is this yeah <laughs> and then you know the the person was like oh that's this i'm like ah Oh, and then we could change it to an idiom in a, in in an in, in American or English idiom that meant the same thing. Yeah, because like back then translations were like they took like months, man. But I think nowadays it's a lot faster because um they sort of have like they it's kind of like they got the experience to be able to like translate a lot faster. That's kind of why I was like I think that's why a lot of animes are like coming out a lot quicker nowadays. Back then you had to wait like years. <laughs> Well, yeah, and it's it's the I mean the digital age changed everything. Um, what we're able to do with the audio software Pro Tools um, is phenomenal. Engineers can can go much much more quickly with with actors because they can compress, they can shorten or le expand, lengthen um, to make things fit a lot better in script wise, rather than um, and and quality control. It's not like shipping a tape back to Japan for them to look at. Mm -hmm. You know, if, even, you know, if it was on an airplane, it would still take hours and hours to get there. And now it's just all over the web. Bam, there it is. Here you go. Uh, you know, with high quality um, audio and video is able to be sent and then checked. And so, yeah, the turnover uh, is a lot faster. And I mean, anime has just gotten more popular. I mean, it's just amazing how how popular and almost it's like a mainstream, you know, cultural thing now, which is wonderful. <laughs> and so I think there's a lot more of the manga, which is, um, which is being, you know, oh hey, let's do this one and let's do that one and this and then, you know, so there's. And there's plenty of people doing new ones and, and doing new anime or people inspired in other countries inspired by anime and doing their own versions. So mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. All right. So I want to take it back to the document real quick with question number three. Uh, ah. So can someone read that all for Jameson, please? I, I will. With all this talk about anime, I'd like to bring it back to video games. Uh, how do you feel about the culture of video games and how fans perceive the roles you've played thus far? The culture of video games? Um, uh, I sort of wish they were easier to play, but that's just because I can't <laughs> play them. Um, I, get, I get lost. And I, I get stuck. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there is there there is the easy mode, and I I can put it on easy mode and get through a bunch of these. Um, I love video games. Um, the culture of them. I mean, <laughs> the right wing people tend to look down upon them as uh, inspiring violence and and you know bad behavior. Um. I don't see that so much. Uh, I mean, there's plenty of video games are global. They're all over the world, and other people don't, you know, have children with AR-15s running around. So I think there's something else going on. Um, and the, I mean, like I'm part of Mortal Kombat. That's a horrendously violent video game, <laughs> but it's it's funny. It's it's dark humor. It's it's takes it to an extreme that. Um, it's the you know uh, slash em, slasher films. They're they're not really scary. They're they're kind of funny. Uh, I have an 18 year old son who has been playing video games all of his life. Um, now granted, when he's screaming profanity at three and four in the morning, that's my that might be a bit much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's yeah. Me. That I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe you shouldn't, you know, and I, I do worry about his blood pressure because, uh, boy, he, he gets pretty worked up on these things. Um, <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, video games, there's just so, um, and they're so diverse. So it's like there's there's more than just you know a culture of video games. There there are cultures uh, because you can find almost anything um, that speaks to you. Fantasy, 
um, violence, uh, mystery, all kinds of just so much, so much interesting stuff in video games. There, um, as for how fans perceive the roles I've played thus far, um, I'm not entirely sure how they have perceived them. They seem to have perceived them well. Um, the feedback that I get, uh, although I, I'm, I am. A very small presence on social media. I I do check it and stuff, but I don't do a whole lot of posting. Um, I tend to to keep my life somewhat private. Uh, <laughs> but as to how the people perceive the the roles, I think they perceive them well, and so I, I've gotten um, a lot of good feedback from people um, as to how how these characters. Um, I mean, in anime, but also in video games. Video games have how the, the characters have touched their lives and meant something to them. Video games, not quite so much because it does tend to be more um, action and less narrative of telling a story. But there are stories in them. There's story mode, and there's um, there's a journey that we, we that we take as as the characters in the game, but then also as the player character takes that journey too. So hopefully they've perceived them well, the roles that I've played thus far, and that I can keep working because I do enjoy it. Any side questions? I can so vouch, far for this? Sorry, sorry uh, I can mm -hmm. vouch from some of my friends that uh, Sojiro has definitely touched their lives plenty. I kind of got, oh. yeah. got a few mm -hmm. of my people into Persona 5 in the past few years, and Sojiro was definitely a character that resonated with some especially one who is a big fan of Futaba and so also at the same Aww. time saw a lot of Sojiro's plot as well and I can yes. say Sojiro definitely a bro yeah. he was really fun um and I mean I'm on cameo and, and Sojiro gets requested a ton uh so yeah Sojiro just I mean as a dad it was fun to play a dad um and the whole tough love kind of thing and how he's so hard on on the Joker at the beginning, but then you see that softer side come out. As an actor, that's so much fun to play that kind of arc. Now, what's also interesting is sometimes you don't know that's the arc because you don't know where it's going. You don't see the the, the script, and so you're just ah, I'm gonna you know grumble 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 grumble. Oh wait a minute, look I'm being nice here. Oh okay, <laughs> and then he starts to things start to move along. Um, but when it's fun to have a character that that has some development like that. Yeah, I love his social link. I think it's fantastic. Probably one of my favorites in the game easily. Ah, uh, good. Definitely my favorite role that you've done. Ah. Uh. All right, so I guess we can move on to question number four. So, Eli, you want to read that? I can take care of that one. All right. Yeah, I got it. As a professional voice actor, are you a fan of film, theater, or television? Did it influence your career personally? What are some of your favorites, if so? Oh, well, I'm definitely a fan, fan of film, theater, and, and television. Um, I love all three. Uh, I started off in the theaters, theater, so that was not like my first love. Um, Shakespeare, um, some of the classics. Uh, but, I mean, in TV, <laughs> back when I was young, it was black and white. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we we had three channels um yeah so <laughs> it is it is just you know cartoons were only on saturday morning oh my god uh so i mean what we have now available is just phenomenal the streaming services uh it's, it's just you know Often I go in and, and you know, like, this is on the cable. Okay, that's fine. Okay, go over to Netflix, go over to Prime Video, go over to Hulu or or um, HBO Max, and and just there's so much content, um, especially during the whole pandemic lockdown. Well, we're still sort of we're still in the pandemic lockdown, not so much, but in the full lockdown, that was really the saving grace. Um, I kept thinking that I should learn to do a musical instrument. I should read more books. No, it was Netflix. <laughs> that, that got me through. Um, theater, definitely, except that, again, the pandemic really put the kibosh on that, um, either doing it or 
uh, watching it, there was there was an effort and some a valiant effort to try to do Zoom theater, um, which only partially worked. Sometimes it was okay, but uh, I'm gosh, I'm really hoping we get this thing under control. We can get back to live theater again. We we get, we just got back to doing it a little bit, and then Omicron, bam. Uh. Um, uh, film, yeah, film is fantastic. Um, I've only done a couple of them. Uh, the the amount of work that goes into making them is phenomenal. I mean, the amount of jobs created is great. Um, but I love science fiction, fantasy, um, escapist, <laughs> maybe because it does take me out of the world we're in right now. Uh, um, and I tell, uh, uh, some of my favorites. Um, well, theater-wise, a lot of my favorites, uh, I mean, Shakespeare was my first and um, my prime love in, in theater. This Shakespearean stuff is, is wonderful. Uh, then um, in TV and film. Well, yeah, with film, the science fiction, fantasy stuff, um, I thought the Lord of the Rings saga series was really very close to the way that I saw it in my mind. Um, I thought Peter Jackson did a fantastic job with that series. Um, I'm watching The Wheel of Time right now, and I'm not quite as gung-ho. It's drawing me in, but a little more slowly than I would like. But then mm-hmm. again, I didn't read those. Um, I didn't read the books. So now it's kind of making me go, oh, I should read the books because there's a whole lot of them. Uh, Game of Thrones, I did read the books first. Uh, and then watched the series, and that was, I thought, really a wonderful interpretation, very well done. And even when they strayed from the story, because they kind of have to, um, because books can provide you so much more information than a visual medium TV film can, uh, I thought they did a very good job with it. And so I loved that one a whole lot. Um, The Expanse, I'm loving and just kind of relishing each little episode and not i started to binge it and then i was, was like when it came back again for the fifth season i re-binged everything beforehand um uh, so i think the expanse is doing really good work i love the show there uh things like i didn't watch the sopranos oh really i'm yeah. sort of watching that this year i didn't but it's so so but the wire i watched the wire that was amazing. Oh, and Lost. A friend of mine was like, you have to see this. And he's like, he had the whole DVD collection. Yeah, it was DVD, not, not Blu-ray. Uh, and he's like, here. And I got sucked into that. Lost was amazing up until the end. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> actually, actually, Jameson, uh, you seen Breaking Bad by any chance? Oh, Breaking Bad. Yes. <laughs> Another one I love that Bad. was so good. And Brian Cranston. Oh. Fantastic just loved his work. He's just yeah. a man. He's phenomenal. Bear Call yep. Saul is awesome too. Really love Bear Call. Which one? Uh, Bear Call Saul. Uh, the oh yeah, the, the, Saul. Uh, the office. Yeah, yeah so, the Better Call Saul. Um, yeah, I haven't catched caught that yet, but it's on my list of things. Um, because I did enjoy those characters. Its <laughs> last season is this year, I think. I yeah. Think. Yeah. Yeah. This but I, I will. I will character. say. If there is one show you have to watch, it is The Sopranos. Ah, uh, okay. Really recommend it. All right. <laughs> You'll love it. It's great. All right. So, question number five, Andre, could you read that, please? Okay. Um, if you had the opportunity to audition for one dream role, then which character would you like to be? Tell us why that role caters to your ambition. Oh, I have been asked this before, and it doesn't, I mean, I don't, I don't really have a dream role. Um, I mean, something that I've either known about and gone, oh, I want to have that role. Um, there are uh, <clears throat> series and, and, and projects that I would like to be a part of. Um, I got into the Star Trek world universe um, with an early video game. I have not yet, I 
they have not yet done Star Wars. And so yeah. that's one, and I've got a ton of friends who are doing it. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. At some point, I hope that yeah, I will get called in um, because it would, it would be so much fun to get to be part of the Star Wars um, thing. I got into the Marvel Universe, which was nice. Um, oh, yeah. Abomination, was it? Abomination, yeah. He was a really fun one to get into. Uh, and to start to play with and go, oh, yeah, I hope this goes somewhere. Um, <laughs> it would be really neat to, I guess, dream role wise, to have to to, to the, be the voice of something like Abomination, where um, on a big screen, you know, in, in a big film, uh, where you, I get to voice, you know, some fun evil character um yeah. I, I like the evil characters uh, I've, I've spent many many years of my youth of sorts my 20s and 30s playing heroes mm -hmm. um and frankly heroes are a little boring uh they tend to be very kind of one note they're just heroes and they go and do this kind of thing there are many, many more heroes now that have um have a flaw which is great because then you have something to kind of work against or play with. Villains always have flaws and they're always working in their minds for the greater good of themselves or their people. They're just villainous from the point of view of the hero. Oh yeah. So villains are much more complex. And as an actor, there's a lot more to, to chew on and to digest and then to try to interpret for an audience. And if you can do a villain and make the audience like you, <laughs> that's the most ultimate um, compliment, I think, as an actor, is that if, if they're like, he's awful, but I really like him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because my... uh, uh, yeah, uh, I know you play like a lot of like really hammy over the top characters that are just like very... Like, they just chew the scenery every time they appear on screen. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, think I have been known favorite, to chew some scenery. My, my favorite antagonist role that you've done, it has to be the king from The Rising Shield Hero. Oh, that was yes. A good one. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Actually. Yeah. I hated his guts. Oh. <laughs> I just rewatched that, too. Holy crap. Mm -hmm. He was not a nice man, no. No, he was not. I lo uh, actually, I know you're in Gurren Lagana's, can't remember his name. Lord Genome. Lord Genome, man. Lord Genome yes. was awesome. He was just... <laughs> he was fun. That was a good villain there. Um, although, again, he was working for the, the, the greater good for his people. He was like, yeah. this, I'm doing this to save everybody. But he was delicious. And he got to this, I mean, just, oh, to play with that. And then getting... <laughs> Just to be this head on the spaceship was kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, that... you know, you know, our character I actually like. Um, your performance was um Elvis and God Hand. Oh, oh, oh yeah, <laughs> that was one which again I uh, tried to play and I've like. Oh, I remember having I a lot of. It. I had a lot of fun recording it, um, but I haven't been able to see the product. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, but I've heard from people that they like it, so that's good. Elvis was funny. That game needs a remaster soon. If, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was like hearing you like curse and smash made me laugh really hard. But I think we can move on to question number six. I, I can read that off. So, uh, do you have any other voice actors that you appreciate in the industry? Any personal favorites to list off? Oh, tons. Um, I hesitate to list any off because I'm sure I will miss people. Um, uh, gosh, Michael Sorich is uh, an old, dear old friend, uh, wonderful director, and um, he does great work. I just heard him in something where it was a dub, and I'm like, that's Michael. Um, crazy, crazy man. As a director, he brought out just amazing things in me, um, as did uh, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn, um, who does a lot of directing of uh, of anime. She directed, and she does all the voice acting as well. She's a wonderful voice actress. Um, 
but again, someone who could bring things out of me as an actor that I did not know I had in there, which is cool. Um, most recently, J.B. Blanc in, uh, as Vander in Arcane. Um, J.B. is, again, an old friend. Just wonderful work. Boy, I was watching Arcane. And I still have I've still held off on the, the, the finale. Um, but his work in Arcane, it was over too soon. I was like, damn, he was so good. Uh, gosh, who else? Um, D. Bradley Baker. I don't really know D personally. But his work um, in creature stuff is just crazy. It's so good. Um, I mean, talking about someone who can make different characters and different sounds that are, you don't, you'd swear it's not the same person. Um, Crispin Freeman, um, old friend. And Crispin, I love his work. He brings um, such an air of kind of mystery and intelligence uh and boy can he his mythological knowledge is just out of this world so it's wonderful to talk with him about um any of these anime things because he's able to relate it to a lot of different things and i've done my joseph campbell research and i've read my band of a thousand faces and things but um i got nothing on crispin <laughs> he, he's <laughs> he's got it down um Oh, well, speaking of Futaba, Erica Lindbeck uh, does wonderful work. I love hearing her work. And she was a lot of fun to play with in Persona 5. But not that we got to play together, but playing off of her stuff um, was fantastic. And she's a lovely lady. Um, gosh, that's all that's coming off to the top of my mind. Uh, oh, uh, uh, Dave Mitchell. Dave B. Mitchell. I think I have to go with this, with the middle name for... Sag reasons. Um, another good friend uh, that uh, he's got an amazing range um, and facility with his voice, which is which I envy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's all I can think of right now. But I'm sure there's there's many that I have missed. Oh, Darren DePaul just popped into my head. Darren, uh, oh, Ryan wonderful Hart. work. <laughs> Yes, yeah, he plays Reinhardt and Overwatch, but many other things too. Uh, and he's he's so good. So, um, gosh, I'll stop there. But there's there's so many. What the wonderful thing about the voice acting community is how supportive we are of each other. Um, we really enjoy each other's work, uh, and it's it's not really as competitive as competitive, I guess, as is, is on camera. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a, not a saying, but a kind of, sort of a saying. I mean, if you, you go to an audition and you've got a bunch of people who all look alike and who aren't talking to each other, that's an on-camera audition. You go to another audition and there's an incredibly diver diverse group of people and are all really excited to talk to each other. That's voiceover. <laughs> and so for me, that's, that's the group I want to be in. Although on-camera is fun too. But an incredibly diverse group of people who are very excited to talk to each other. So I'm curious, uh, does anyone have any other side questions before we move on to number seven? Ooh, that I can go nope. for. Nope. All right, so let's move on to fan conventions. I'll also read this one. Uh, have you ever been to any big fan conventions? If not, would you like to go someday? Yeah, no, I've been to, I just went to uh, LACC. Um, I've not been to San Diego Comic-Con. Um, oh. that's way too huge. Um, parking. Yeah. Uh, but, um, I was part of the AVOX sneak peek. AVOX is a, um, a voiceover con, um, that we're going to do in July of this year. Yay. Uh, we were supposed to do it two years ago and then, you know, the pandemic. Um, but we did a sneak peek and in partnership with LA Comic-Con, um, which was a lot of fun. Um, I've done Anime Expo on at least a, a panel with them. Um, when I actually went out to, to Ohio and did Matsurikan um, back before the lockdown, uh, that was a lot of fun. I think it was 2018 when I did that one. So I've been to a few, um, not a whole lot. I haven't kind of jumped into it the way that some other voice actors have. Um, but 
what I do find wonderful about them is the ability or the opportunity to interact with the fans and to hear back from people, you know, what things have meant to them. Because as I said, we do this thing in a dark booth by ourselves for the most part. Um, and we don't know the literally millions of people who are watching these things and, and what they get out of it. And so when you hear back from people, uh, that's, that's, that's very meaningful. It's very touching. And, uh, I feel honored to, to do the work that I'm doing in that regard. But you know, the cons are fun. And I'm, uh, as things open up, um, pandemic wise, um, I'll be doing more of them and getting back to do, getting back to do them, but also but doing more. So I'm going to move on to question number eight, and I want Brandel to read that, please. <clears throat> okay. What typical mistakes there are, sorry, I already made one. What typical mistakes <laughs> that you make um, in regards of voice acting? Typical mistakes regarding voice acting. Not reading the words. <laughs> well, that's um, the easy one. That's an easy one, uh, but it's not as easy as you might think. Um, I mean, that's because, yes, yeah, somebody has written out those words and you try to be, uh, you try to honor them as much as possible. There are times when the character forces you to go in a different direction. Um, so that can be a mistake, but it can be a happy mistake sometimes. Um, so that's kind of a typical mistake there. Um, yeah, typical mistakes. Not properly preparing. Um, I... I didn't prepare as uh, as rigorously as I do now. I am getting older, and I want to maintain my vocal health, so I'm much more careful about mm, not drinking alcohol the night before or I'm working on a gig, um, making sure my hydration is is I'm hydrating properly, so I'm going to have uh, the stamina to get through the session. Um, researching the character or um, doing vocal warm-ups, singing warm-ups to make sure that when I arrive at the studio or walk into my home studio booth, uh, that I'm in proper shape. I'm, I'm ready to go uh, and can respond to whatever direction the director wants to give me. Uh, when I was younger, it was, I mean, I was, I even, at the beginning of my career, I would record um, a line or two of the character so that in the car, on the way to the, uh, not, on the way to the gig for the second episode or whatever, I would then play back that recording so that I would walk into the session having given myself an audio reference. Now, that's th the engineer is going to do that anyway. And so I've relaxed on that over the years, but I was... I was into preparing, but I didn't do the kind of vocal warm-up preparation back then that I do now. Um, and I hear that um, from directors, they can tell. They notice a difference if you're warmed up and ready to go, or if you're not. And, you know, half an hour into the session, now your voice is different because now you're warmed up. And then they have to go back and pick up those first few lines because it sounds different. Because there's a difference that happens once you're warmed up and, and everything's working in your voice uh, and in your breathing. So, yeah, lack of, of reading exactly the words that are written, um, lack of preparation, uh, or uh, not only in vocal warm-ups, but also in vocal health. Uh, would be typical mistakes. Um, in general, uh, not not having enough acting training. I have plenty of that, so I'm not worried about that. But oftentimes, people, I think, uh, aspiring voice actors, as you know, mostly, I suppose, but people neglect the, uh, or not neglect, but don't. Don't count the acting training as as being all oh, that important. If you've got a good voice, that's enough, and it really isn't. Um, 
a good voice helps certainly and i was i got into the business a lot because i had a voice but i also got into the business because i can act and that ability to act and to realistically portray a, a given circumstance or situation will far outweigh what your voice sounds like you do want to make your voice sound like the character looks yes but it's really is all about acting so those are three big things that come to mind right off the bat uh, my response actually ties into the next question but tolkien crazy cat lady i'm gonna let you read that off <laughs> okay um how do you feel about screaming in a voice acting session it was illustrated that sean Schemmel passed out during a situation like that how would you prepare if you were tasked to do this don't <laughs> um i i have regularly thrashed my voice over the years um and have gotten i mean somewhat happenstance and just because you have to, to in order to survive i had to figure this out i have in the last and I was, okay that's something i did during the pandemic was a deep dive into vocal health vocal anatomy um and vocal function and breathing how we how we breathe but how we make sound and how for me specifically how do i make this sound like screaming without killing myself um and being able to work the next day i worked on there was a game called everquest many 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 years 20 some odd years ago um that i did a four-hour session of monster voices on and i couldn't work for four days Oh shoot! Wow! God! Oh my God! It was Dang. I thrashed it so badly, and this was after I had had acting training for so you know, no hmm? so I'd been acting professionally for twenty five thirty years at that point. I was not a newbie, but in order to make the sounds that I needed to make, I. I didn't place it properly and I didn't use the techniques that I know now that um, that you can do. That being said, especially in a video game, you know, the military stuff, uh, you know, you're grenade, whatever, you're doing all that kind of stuff. You're in a tank, so you're starting at 10 and going up from there. That's your base level is 10 because you have to scream over the motor. Um, in the the deaths that we have to do okay you're gonna be you know, shot okay that's pretty quick stabbing oh that's a little bit longer and a little more screaming on fire that's horrific you have to scream bloody murder when you're dying that's the last <laughs> effort you do is death by fire um because it does require a horrific scream well if you have um there are techniques it's similar to the rock and roll pharyngeal scream um, that rockers do. Now, some of them do thrash their voices, but some of them can do shows night after night with you know screaming, and they're fine. So there are ways and things that you can use that uh, that modify that sound, and it can sound the same way as. Uh, uh, as, as an actual scream, but you're not using your vocal folds in the same way. Um, so it, it has to it gets, it gets into really detailed anatomy and and air pressure and the adduction, the strength of your pulling your vocal folds together. That uh, you have to find an, a, a balance, and then you can add in things on top. Um, everybody knows what your epiglottis is, right? Yes. Okay. Epiglottis is a little flap of cartilage that sits on top of your trachea. And when you swallow, it goes down and it closes, to, or mostly closes, to keep food from going down your breathing tube. But you also have false vocal folds on top of those. And those kind of come in and cover things too. They don't have as much muscle, but they can flap. And so when I'm doing a voice like Lou Boo, I'm flapping those. <laughs> At least I think that's what I'm doing. I'm not using my vocal folds to make that sound. I'm doing this with my vocal folds, but I'm doing something else on top of it. And as far as I can figure, 
it's that because it's it seems to me higher than what's called the Louis Armstrong growl. Do you all know who Louis, Louis, know who Louis Armstrong was? Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Louis Armstrong was a trumpet player um, in Jungle Book. Uh, he was the um, uh, the orangutan. Uh, if you've ever seen the old Disney Jungle Book. Um, I want to be like you. That thing. <laughs> he talked like this. This is the way he talked. <laughs> and that sound is different from this sound, which is, I'm assuming doing some nasal stuff, but with Lou Boo, I'm, I think I'm working on something higher than that epiglottis. And so I think it's the, the, the vocal, false vocal folds or flaps. They're fur and they're, they're uh, uh, <sighs> they're old flaps that yeah, they don't work the same way. But anyway, uh, the Louis Armstrong growl uh, in my research, it was like, okay, there are actually little muscles on the sides of your epiglottis, which I guess help in your swallowing and closing off, maybe, because they're on the sides. But when you tighten those, you can get that growl going. And if the growl isn't on the folds themselves, because that would hurt. If I did it on the folds, ouch. I can't. I can't. I can't. A, wow. That is a wow. great. Demon. I felt that. Dr. Claw. Does that, that like yeah. Dr. Claw? Like, <laughs> that is a great demon voice. And I worked, I was like, how do I make this work? And I can't because, I mean, I can. And I've told people, you know, in a session, I can, do, I can give you that voice, but for only about 20 minutes to half an hour, and I can't yell. But if you, you know, make the, if they turn up the gain on the microphone, and I talk in the ear, it's amazing. <laughs> but, I can feel that, that it's like, oh, ugh, don't want to do much of that. Whereas I can do Lou Boo for four hours, no problem. And it's just getting into here and I get the same sort of growl, but it's, there's more air pressure. It's keeping things off of the folds and using mm, loose tissue in my pharynx <laughs> in some way. I would love to get, there's a, a scoped. Uh, lar lar laryngoscoping, whatever. They take a camera, stick it up your nose. <laughs> Doesn't sound fun, yeah. but they shoot down and look at your vocal folds and what they're doing. And I would love at some point to go in and go through some different voices like that and see what is exactly happening. Because I have an idea, but I can't see in there. And mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't want to mess up my ability to do it by yeah. knowing what it is. Um, but that's what I imagine it is. And so for screaming, it is. A, uh, a relaxation. It's not tensing my vocal folds because again, the more tension you have on them, the harder um, they work and the more easily they are bruised or abrased. So it's relaxing my vocal folds using something else like the pharyngeal flaps to make the ah, part of the scream and then breathing. Um, Sean probably passed out because he hyperventilated. Yeah. And that's just poor breathing technique uh, or not knowing proper breathing technique, I mean, not even poor, because yeah, I can get lightheaded if I do that. But if I prepare properly, there are breathing techniques that are uh, actually kind of ancient yoga techniques that allow you to increase your CO2 tolerance. Something we all like to do now where they have, we have to wear masks everywhere um, because people are going, I can't breathe because the mask is giving them a greater CO2 concentration, but not great enough to suffocate you, but enough to make you feel like it's suffocating you. It's a very interesting thing because we do need CO2, apparently. Um, it helps to exchange the oxygen in the blood. But the if you increase that um, CO2 tolerance level, in the books that I've read and think, it's uh, w one journalist was inspired by freedivers. You know what freedivers do? Oh no! Explain they, it to they us. They don't. They don't yeah, use. Please. They don't use scuba gear. Oh. And they go down, uh, like pearl divers or, or freedivers, but they're also freedivers that do this for fun, and they go down. I don't know what how far down they go, but I mean, th I think it's like you know 100 feet or more, which is like how my ears pop after 10 feet, um, but. They go down for like five and six minutes at a time. I think Tom Cruise did um, in the Mission Impossible one where he was underwater. 
he was under for six minutes. Yeah, that's a ghost protocol. That was ghost insane, yeah. insane. But in Titanic, oh gosh, what's her name? I can see her face. Kate Winslet. Kate Winslet did seven minutes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so beat him. But She's you can do this by, by learning, and I'm, it's stuff that I'm working with now, that learning how to increase your CO2 tolerance um, so that you don't have that same out of breath feeling and you can hold your breath for a long time. Um, one of the things I've been doing is it's Wim Hof. He's a crazy guy called the Iceman, but his, a part of his um, uh, beginning uh, exercises, did you breathe um, like in and out pretty powerfully for 30 times? So 30 kind of thing. And it's almost hyperventilating. It's close. But then you breathe everything out and you hold your breath. And you do three rounds of this. And by the third round, and he does 30 seconds, a minute, and then a minute and a half. I'm now at the point where that last, after doing three rounds or the third round, I exhale and I hold an empty breath for two minutes, which is just crazy to me. I'm like, how is that possible? I've emptied everything out. So I'm not even doing a full breath. It's all gone. And I can still hold for two minutes. So there's something about that. And so if you can get something prepped like that before you're going to do some kind of screaming situation, um, that helps you to not pass out. Um, but if you, you know, you can get yourself to that point. You just have to know your limits. In, in, in your breath, that if you get to that, if you've exhausted your oxygen level, that's when you're going to pass out. So. I just want to say for the record, this is the greatest scientist session we had on this podcast. Yes, it really yes, it was. I'm so sorry. I'm, no. It's so I good. It's, it's I am, I'm a geek about some things, and definitely uh, this whole voice, maybe because it is now my livelihood, but how it works, how it evolved. That's another fascinating story, but we won't go into that now, but how it works and the functions of it and how we can make it work better. Um, it's, it's just fascinating to me. And the fact that, that we don't really know how to breathe, we just do it because, oh yeah, we just breathe. And then you'll start looking into some of the ancient records, um, yoga and um, Buddhist stuff, and you get into, oh, no, this is the way you should breathe, and this is why. Sometimes they don't tell you why, but you, you know, for, for health reasons, you should breathe through your nose, not through your mouth. Oh, who knew? Great. So, yeah, fun stuff. <laughs> Hey, I've been getting a lot of good notes through this, so I'm not complaining. Yeah, yeah. Right. We're learning a yeah. lot. Yeah. You're, on, you're on a panel full of geeks. I think you're okay. Oh, yeah. good. We love learning. Yay. Look, you're with learning uh, is good. your resident geek, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to move on to question number 10. So what is your favorite role, or should I say plural for roles thus far? Oh, gosh. Yeah, roles, because I can't pick one. Ah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, well, I mean, Sojuro is right up there because he was just such a delight to live with and to embody. Um, that was just, uh, yeah, so much to play with there. Um, and near in some of the, some of the same ways with the whole father connection, um, not as much narrative arc to play with, but there was a lot going on, um, underneath with that character. Uh, um, Bane Bloodhoof uh, in World of Warcraft has been a lot of fun to come back to over the years uh, and watch him develop as the writers come up with different things. Um, he's been a lot of fun. Ryder from Fate Zero oh, was yes. just a joy. <laughs> that was the, that was a return to form. You were perfect. Yeah, you were just that great. one was. Oh, thank you. He was such a. I mean, the joy of life. Now, I didn't agree with all of his philosophy, but um, his his just grab life by the balls and have fun with it <laughs> was such a joy to do. And um, it was, yeah, 
he he was a lot of fun. Um, the Count, uh, Monte Cristo, uh, Gankatsuo, uh, was another really wonderful arc to play with. Um, and again, one of those ones where we don't know where it's going because, I mean, I knew the story of the Count of Monte Cristo, yeah. But, oh, this is a different one, and we're doing this, and we're doing this, and we're doing this. I'm like, oh, wow. I won't do a spoiler. I could probably do a spoiler. But um, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, that's happening. Oh. <laughs> totally changed what I thought about what was happening. Um, uh, was it Ovan who had that? No, no. It was Oikawa and Digimon. Another early villain that I did where <laughs> all of a sudden the demon possessing him comes out of his nose and he's not an, an <laughs> evil man. He's a nice man. What? Actually, Jameson, I was going to bring up a rule. Uh, there was another character that's like Ryder and Fate. Uh, Leo from Guilty Gear. Yeah, he's the, oh, the kingly guy. Yep. Yes, Leo. Leo Whitefang. Um, yeah, no, he's been because uh, been fun to play with. Um, I'm trying to think on the narrative of that because He's got the brother character, right? That we that we are antagonistic. We we do a lot of kind of fighting with each other. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, I can't remember who plays. I know who it is, but I can't remember who it is. Uh, Kai? who plays the brother? Can't remember. Okay. No way. Um, but that yeah, that's Leo. Another one very much like that. So those are my my tops there. I think. As, I got a question actually. You say you did yeah. some stage plays and whatnot, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what's yep. your favorite stage play you have done? Oh. Huh. Oh gosh, they're all so different. Um, I've gotten to play Oberon twice. Oberon and Theseus in uh, Midsummer Night's Dream of Shakespeare. Uh, and I mean, once was eighth grade, so that was a very long time ago. Uh, and another was, um, so my daughter's 26 now, so 21 years ago. Um, that was a bizarre one because the it was set in Sedona, Arizona, and um, we were Native American spirit uh, animals as the fairies. So Oberon, King of the Fairies, was an eagle, uh, and I had to act with an, a big eagle head on my head. <laughs> and I had a broadsword fight with Titania, who was a puma. So she had a puma head on her head. And the eyes on our heads were such that for the characters to look at each other, we had to act looking at each other's feet and fight with swords. <laughs> this was the battle of the species this was amazing this was crazy and it was just so weird because you you couldn't act with someone um like looking in the eyes you had to look at their feet and go okay and then know the choreography well enough that we didn't hurt each other um but oh I'm trying to think there is my my thesis role in graduate school was uh it, it's a we only did five hours i think but it was a nine hour postmodern german play about vaguely about the king arthur cycles um and i played mordred in it the bastard son of arthur and it was one of the weirder plays I've ever been in, but we had, because it was five hours long, we did two hours one night, three hours the other. Uh, and it was graduate school, so we're all crazy and having fun. Um, but that was, that was one of my favorite roles in that it was Arthurian, which I love the Arthur legends, but it was also um, very, very modern. And was weird it was just weird and i don't think we understood exactly what it was um because it was packed full of allegory and illusion and um yeah it was it was a crazy show so 
I mean, I, I think I would have to say that one just because it was, it was a very uh, enlightening performance for me. Because as an actor, there are many different ways of approaching acting. Um, internally, externally, you know, method acting, presentational acting, all kinds of fun stuff. Well, I had read, um, I'd read a, a book. It was a practical approach to acting. It was, uh, oh gosh, what's his name? Anyway, uh, uh, very famous um, playwright or maybe acting coach. Anyway, it'd written, it was, it was a very thin book. And I had been very much a in-your-head sort of actor, um, very much in the, mm, all, not quite the American method acting, but but close, which comes out of a Russian Stanislavski tradition that was very internal. Um, although Stanislavski also had an external component, we just didn't focus on that here in the States. It got very internal. But the thing is, it doesn't matter what you're thinking. I mean, it doesn't in film because cameras can pick up so much and you can think something and something will happen on your face. You can think it in the theater, but the audience is at least 20 feet away from you. They're not going to pick up on what you're thinking. They're going to pick up on what you're doing. So this practical approach really went into a physical aspect of of acting um there's the idea that if you want to be happy or to play happy just jump up and down a little for like 30 seconds you start to laugh i mean i, I defy you to jump up and down without getting at least a smile on your face it's you so you can do a physical thing which then makes wow an internal thing manifest and visual oh you're laughing i can see you're happy you're funny you're whatever so that book really changed um and honed in some some aspects of acting for me and my i mean of course i had the lines to speak but my and, and the character of mordred part of his um part of his his uh issues with being the bastard son of arthur is that arthur does not recognize him and so I played with the idea that I just wanted people to notice me. So that inspired me to go a little more outrageous in my behavior and to basically just mess with people on stage. <laughs> <laughs> and not only just people, but the fellow actors I was with, which may have irritated them a little bit, but it that irritation was totally appropriate for the character and my behavior was appropriate because i was just trying to get a rise out of somebody you know i want you to notice me i want you to you know say something to me i want you to do something um and it it freed me up in a certain way which uh which i think made that role uh different from other roles that i have done okay all right, so we're gonna move on to the next question. Is there any potential future roles that you could talk about that will possibly get us excited? If it's under NDA, don't worry about it. Everything could be under discretion. Oh, everything's under NDA these days. Oh, cause yes, uh, there's, there's some fun stuff that's going on that hopefully the game will be out end of the year, they say, but you never know with these things. Uh, there's so many, stuff that can't happen in the pipeline but um they've been doing multiple sessions with it uh and having a lot of fun i think it's gonna be a lot of i hope it's gonna be a, a good game um because i'm having fun doing it uh well the i guess it came out last year the dungeons and dragons dark alliance Ooh. came out mm -hmm. um that was one that was a lot of fun to work on mm -hmm. um and then I didn't hear much about it. So I was like, oh, that's too bad. I haven't gotten it to play it. Um, so I'm, I'm just as bad as everybody else. But uh, we had, at least I had a lot of fun with the, the banter involved. Um, and I love those kind of uh, group player because this is four players, uh, four characters because it's the Dungeons and Dragons. Um, uh, God, uh, R A, what's his name? Anyway, bad old mind. Um, but anyway, it's, it's, it's there's the wizard, there's the dwarf, there's the barbarian, and there's the archer. But uh, I mean, I used to play as a family. We all used to play um, uh, Gauntlet. Um, 
on Xbox. And it was so much fun because the whole family would get together and we'd be running around, you know, doing stuff. And then I did uh, Diablo 3 and was the player character of the monk in that one. And then that was similar in that we could get together, um, not split screen, but all four people on the same page, on the same screen and running around doing stuff, uh, which is fun. And I believe this is in the same vein. Um, and so when you get more people together, there's more banter going on between the characters and, and it's a lot of fun. So that was one that was like, oh, I, I would hope that more had come of that. But anything, yeah, everything that's, that's coming out in the future is under NDA. Um, which sucks, but we do want to honor their <laughs> their uh, you know intellectual property rights. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's uh, sometimes it's best to wait for what's to come. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it yeah. Is necessary. And it, it makes it tough for us to do things like interviews because people go, "What are you working on?" I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Don't want I mean, to get if... you in any hot water at all. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I, <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you can have a studio that wants you to talk about something, and that's great. Um, but in general, the things that I sign are pretty strict and I wonder how some of these people are posting things online the way they do, but okay. <laughs> yeah. Like leaking the voice cast. Like that. Yeah. Oh, leaking yes. concept art, you know? Yeah. Here we don't, we don't, we don't ask for that or we don't do that. So. <laughs> yeah. I, I saw a couple of years ago with with Fire Emblem, how breaking NDA can screw you, so... Uh, oh, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Especially with Nintendo. Yeah. I wouldn't Nintendo touch play. that with a 30-foot pole, man. Yep. <laughs> Alright, but uh, next up is number 12, so... Uh, let's see. Who hasn't read in a while? Let me take a look at the list. I haven't read it all, dude. Since you since yeah, you're out of yourself, out. you can go ahead. You can read Inferno, yeah. <laughs> right. Have you ever done things like full body mocap, which is featured in video games? If you haven't, then would you be privy to the idea? Yes, I have done mocap. Um, it's a lot of fun. As a theater performer, that is very exciting to me in its um, freeing up from the microphone. Because, I mean, we are in a booth by ourselves. Okay. You may have, and I, I tend to do a lot of physical motion within the booth, sometimes striking my hand on the music stand or something, um, messing up my take, but I get as physical as I can because that physicality helps me put communication, meaning and emphasis into my voice. So... The the issue with that is that you have to maintain your mouth to microphone distance and aspect because as soon as you turn your head, the engineer is like, like dude, you went off access. You got to do it again. Oh, God. So maintaining your relationship to the microphone and doing whatever body contortion you need to do, especially if you're doing something where you know, you're injured, you know, you can... You can do this kind of stuff, but if you twist your body and do that, it gets it sounds better. So being able to do mocap um, and full performance capture is really fun. It's somewhat difficult trying, I mean, when using like the avatar rigs, uh, <laughs> acting with other people <laughs> with, with this kind of Equus head on their head. Uh, and if you get too close, you whack into each other with these contraptions. Um, you really have to ignore the fact that you have a, a camera and a microphone on the end of this stick snout that you have that's just on your face. And you look at the other person and there's dots on their face. Uh, and if you can get past all that, um, it is very freeing in that you can do movement. Um, you can act out a scene. and. Uh, sometimes they even have things on the monitors in the in the volume in the space with the the cameras and the computers, so that you can see what you look like, which really helps you in your in your movement. Um, Abomination was uh, was perform was uh, mocap. I came back in later and did lines, um, so it wasn't full performance capture. 
but it certainly was mocap. And that was another one where I, having to act with feet, um, because Abomination is quite large. And so I was talking to somebody, and she was normal sized. So within the performance capture, I had to speak to her feet because then that gave my eye line the proper on the on the you could see it on the uh on the monitor in the in the booth in the in the volume was okay i have to look this far down to look like i'm looking at her in the face when it's set up in this way and the villain was supposedly floating up in the air above me so then to talk to him i had to look eight to ten feet above his head and I screwed that scene up more than once, looking at somebody in the eyes. Because <laughs> it's like, damn it. Um, <laughs> so hard to, to, to maintain that because as an, as an actor, you want to talk to somebody face to face in the eyes. Um, but yeah, no, mocap is a lot of fun. I did stuff on Call of Duty doing mocap. Um, Red Faction was one that I did performance capture on. Um, but one of those stuff happens. I got uh, I got replaced by a celebrity. <laughs> well, so it came out with not me in the game, um, but uh, yeah, it's fun to do. I've um, I've had some uh, some movement issues uh, lately, so I'm hoping to get past those and and maybe get back into doing some mocap stuff. But I have not been I had hip arthritis that was making it so I couldn't walk normally oh, damn. doesn't work when you're trying to do mocap so yes but now i have a i'm a, officially a cyborg i have <laughs> i have a, a metal hip and i'm <laughs> gonna get an, i'm gonna get another one and another you know we'll see how long it takes but uh i'm i'm a month into my new hip and uh it's better than the old hip so that's good you ever think yeah. of that line like we have the technology we can rebuild oh yeah them. <laughs> the, the six million old man. I'm, I'm, I'm tell you, I mean, medical technology. I'm just blown away by mm -hmm. how fast they did it, how good it feels. Um, and I just saw the X-ray today. Uh, I went into a post-op uh, meeting, and it's like, oh my god, that's that's me, and that's the metal thing there, and it's there's screws going into. The, <laughs> oh my god, but. <laughs> It feels great. And, you know, the muscles are still recovering because it's a little traumatic to have your leg disconnected from your body. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Wait. what they do. Uh, so, but that is uh, um, very cool. Well, look on the bright side. One day we'll get cybernetic arms. <laughs> it's like Jack from Mortal Kombat. That is the yeah. picture. Yeah. It really is because, I mean, they can do this. That I mean, it's just a hop, skip, and a jump to being able to, you know, replace. They replace hips and knees. <laughs> uh, they must be able to replace a shoulder joint because yeah. that's a similar ball and socket thing. Um, and it's just I mean a matter of once they learn how to interface with our nervous system, and they're getting there. there I, I saw some stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, Netflix looking through those documentaries and things but with um, prosthetic arms that they're able to do some control. And God, I can't remember which one it was, but it, it was an arm and he was able to pick up, you know, a glass or something that would could break if he did too much pressure. And it was enough feedback that he could pick it up without crushing it. Uh, that's crazy. So it's coming, you're right. Is it because it's in a ghost limb when you feel the limb, but it's not there, which happens yeah. with the amputation. Phantom pain. Phantom sense. Yep. Oh, that's phantom. That's phantom. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. But I, I. All this talk of metal arms making me think we're going to see the Winter Soldier pop up sometime. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> just give it time. Yeah. <laughs> and Sebastian Stan. Okay, there's a good actor. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That that's what I'd want. I I'd, I'd want a metal arm. I don't know. <laughs> I want to be like Venom Snake from Metal Gear 5, the rocket arm. Rocket <laughs> arm! <laughs> <laughs> but I guess we can move on to the final question. And Brandel, can you read that? 
Well, if you insist, uh, <clears throat> yes, yes. Are there are there any tips that you um? Sorry, let me read this. Sorry, um, are there any tips that you would give people who want to um start voice acting? Like um, it's inexperienced um beginners. Yeah, um, I mean, I do. I have I have some students that I'm coaching. Um, it starts with acting. So, acting classes are 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 important those are the most important um you've got to have the ability to use your imagination in that way and be able to to push yourself into an imaginary imaginary circumstance and respond as you know as you think that this character would uh and that all comes with acting and being able to acting classes and being able to free up um, free up your imagination. We, I mean, we have it when we're kids. We play act all the time. We have a great time. And then you become, you know, preteen and a teenager and become self-conscious and don't like the sound of your voice or don't like your body. Uh, you start shutting down your, your sense of play and sense of free play. You start, or at least I did, it, and you start monitoring yourself and going, Oh, I, I, you know, what, what are they thinking about me or, um, how am I appearing to somebody else? You, you get tied up in, and, in, in shutting and you start shutting down your creative expression. So a lot of what acting class is learning how to undo that, not necessarily societal, but our psychological, um, filters that we stick on ourselves. Yes, there still has to be an actor is an is a craftsman and a, and uh, and an artist at the same time. So the craftsman aspect has to be, uh, you know, loud enough to be heard in the back row, or keep your mouth in the same relationship to the microphone, um, or you know, stand in such a position that you're on the mark for the camera. So those are technical craft things. Then you have the artist in you, which is experiencing this imaginary story and imaginary character and in a realistic way not so realistic that you stabbed your buddy with your sword <laughs> <laughs> so there's you know you always have to have that kind of awareness and that kind of dichotomy going on in inside um, and that takes training um but it all starts with the acting so acting training acting training acting training then um the, the vocal training um that you know learning how to how to read so that it doesn't sound like you're reading if you give somebody um a piece of text to read it's not going to sound conversational it's going to sound like they're reading unless they've got the training and then you can make it sound conversational even though you're reading the words and even though you're doing a cold read you can do it and that's something that we practice is okay you know yeah, well, for me, uh, I was reading to my kids. That was the ultimate cold read. In a cold read situation where you have a casting director and you're on audition or something, they'll give you a minute to look it over. When you're reading to your children, here's the book, Dad. Okay. And you just read. And you read and you read. And if it's a book they've read, they can catch you if you mess up the words. Um, if you have the wrong character voice. No, that's not the right voice, Dad. Oh, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the kids are brutally honest. It's wonderful. Um, but that was fantastic uh, training for, for voice acting. Uh, so you find children to read aloud to. Uh, <laughs> that's a good one. Um, listening to what's out there. Uh, and, I mean, it does start with imitation. That's where I began, um, you know, as a kid watching those cartoons and you you mimic them um mm -hmm. it's it's a lot of how we learn to speak is what we hear we that's we imprint with that and then we can mimic it back uh so that's that's a a, a good kind of way to kind of ease your way into it and to practice a little bit but finding what your niche is or niche whatever your 
your genre, what is going to be, you know, whether it's video games or anime or both, mm -hmm. um, or commercials or narration or whatever. Um, there are lots of people that can do multiple things, and there's some that can just do one or two, and that's fine. You can find the work. That's the wonderful thing right now is there's just a ton of work. There's so much out there, and it's so easy with a computer and a microphone and some very simple from, with free software to have the ability to audition for roles. Yeah, you got to get an agent to get the really good auditions and to get to a certain level, and in, if you're going to work remotely, you need to build a home studio, um, and that does take some money. But, you know, it's a good time to be a voice actor. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, I got a question, actually. It's a Bleach-related question. Uh, how did you, um, mm -hmm. like, how did you get the role of Chad? You yeah, know, that's what like... we want to really know. Oh. It Mm -hmm. Chad was very... could be more perfect either too because um we were watching Bleach with my friends because one had uh, seen it. And here we are talking to you to watch Chad like. Uh, yeah. Chad, oh, yeah. okay, Chad was, Chad was interesting. Um, the studio. I say I think I I think I took over Chad somewhere in the episode one fifty. Somewhere in there, you will hear a voice change. Before that, someone was doing it, and I don't know what the circumstance was, um, but the studio even, and people, people thought it was me, and I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not working this show. Um, the studio even at one point asked me to do like autographs for it, and I'm like, guys, I don't do this show. <laughs> You're doing it. Why are you asking me to do this? Um, and something happened where the guy doing it couldn't do it anymore. I don't know what, exactly what happened. I didn't talk to him or anything. But they went, would you do this? I'm like, well, everybody thinks I'm doing it anyway, sure. So I stepped in. <laughs> yeah. And it was interesting because then I had to go, I had to listen to his interpretation and try to somewhat mimic it. I mean, I did, took the qualities that he was doing all right and then tried to, to to do my version of that which over the next 20 30 episodes kind of morphed into what i was then doing as chad so i settled down into my own version of it but at the beginning it was I was trying to honor what he had done and continued on that way. But then it was obvious that this was going to be going on for a long time. So uh, I eased into a little more um, of my own interpretation on it. But the funnest, funny, funniest thing about this was the fact that I got um, reverse hate mail. Wait, what? <laughs> okay, because huh? people thought I was doing it. So when i actually took it over i got email on my website with people pissed off that i had been replaced and that new guy was not as good <laughs> but they thought it was that i had been replaced by somebody else because they thought i was doing it when i wasn't doing it so when i took it over and i was doing it then i got oh he's not as good <laughs> you're not as good <laughs> wow. you're not as good as yourself Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Throwing me for a loop. I thought imposter. you were him the whole time. No, there was yeah. there was somebody else at the beginning. Um, because I do remember being asked to do signatures to sign some some PR stuff. And I'm like, I don't work on this show. <laughs> That's and then we found out that people thought I was working on it. So then when the studio said, Hey, would you do it? I'm like, sure. And it's <laughs> it's kind of out there already. Irony. Oh, yes. Lots of irony there. Well, you were fated to do this role. <laughs> well, yeah. Actually, speaking of one, uh, you know that uh, Bleach is coming back, uh, Jameson? I saw something about the, the Thousand Year War. Yeah, the arc. Mm. They're, they're wrapping up. Uh, they're basically taking what they're... They're wrapping up the anime by going to the manga, which um, the Bleach had a really rushed ending, and um, they're trying to fix that with this new anime. Cool. Hopefully, yes. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, so I saw that they're doing that. Um, I saw that people are hoping that uh, we will all come back and reprise our roles. I have not been contacted. Don't know what's going on with that at all. It's totally, oh, no. up, to, it's totally up to the um, the the uh, property hold, rights holder um, and what they want, and then whatever studio they contract to do it, and who that studio wants uh, and their director. So there's there's a, a lot of of chiefs <laughs> ahead yeah. that have the deciding vote as to mm. how any project is going to be done. But it, it comes down to the money people, the ones who, who own the rights to the whatever intellectual property it is, uh, because they're the ones that can say ultimately yes or no. So we'll see if they, you know, what they want to do with it. Oh, yeah. So that's up in the air. We'll see what's going on with that. But I He's think... So um... Yeah, I, I think that's the end of the interview. It was very fun uh, having you on, and uh, I want to get some outros done from the people. But first and foremost, yeah. I like to outro you where we can find you on social media, any websites or people you want to plug. Oh, well, it's a pleasure talking with you guys. Thank you. This has been a lot of fun. Um, I'm on Facebook at a, as a uh, Jameson Price public page, as the one that I have for the public. Uh, and uh, so people can post stuff there or message me there um i'm on twitter as uh, at jameson price and i think that's also instagram is at jameson price so i've got those going don't jump on instagram as often so i'm an old person i do facebook uh but i do check check twitter a lot and kind of keep an eye on what's going on out there i do have a website uh jamesonkprice.com um and i do try to keep that updated, but it's tough, again, with the NDAs to talk about things that I've done. But people do message me on there. Um, and it's yeah, just Jameson at jamesonkprice.com is the email. And that uh, goes, you know, I check those emails multiple times a day and uh, have responded to people. Oh, I'm also on Cameo. So that's kind of fun. Um, I've been doing cameos for a while and some some fun things, you know, birthdays and weddings and World of Warcraft Guild congratulations and things. So it's it's kind of fun to do these things. So um I think that's all of that stuff there. And yeah, just hopefully end of the year there's a game coming out that's um I'm pretty sure a relatively big one. <laughs> There are several done before, so it's 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 one of those uh, a successful franchise. So we'll see where that goes. Yes. Awesome. So we're gonna outro the rest of the panel, and then we're gonna get out of here. So Andre, where can we find you on social media? You can find me at twitter.com as Andre Beaver. Uh, I do have a YouTube. Uh, very casual. I don't really do much with it. Just really amateur game. Yeah, that's my outro. Mr. Eli. You can find me on Twitter at Gamma Alias. Inferno? You can find me on Twitch and YouTube at InfernoDragon343 and on Twitter at InfernoDragon3D. Lady Tolkien. Um, you can find me on both Twitter and YouTube on, uh, at Lady Tolkien. Right, right. What's your intro, man? Or uh, outro. You can find sorry. You can find me on Twitter at the Rad Rad. Um, I'm mostly talking about video games and yelling at football because the Philadelphia Eagles are in the playoffs, and I'm just fingers crossed. And I also have a YouTube channel called Rad Rad's Rad Games that I've gone back to last year, where I've done arcade runs of a full series, and I've been getting back to that. So Rad Rad's Rad Games on YouTube. And you can find me on Twitter at rent operative underscore. You can find me on uh, YouTube at Renegade Operative, Twitch, Renegade underscore operative. Uh, I have some videos uploaded, but I have not set them unlisted yet. So I'm going to do that tonight. And last but not least, Mr. Brendel. Uh, yes, you can find me on Twitter at Immortal Brendel and Twitch at Sir Brendel. I mean, it's a barren wasteland on Twitch, though, but I'll fix that soon, hopefully. <laughs> hey, that's it. Yes. 
all right and we are the infinite ammo syndicate once again thank you jameson for coming by and we are signing off on the recording